Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. In 2023, we've already seen many FDA approvals. To help us better understand one of these approvals, to catnip and trastuzumab for our metastatic colon cancer patients, we have Dr. Saab from Mayo Clinic here today. Dr. Saab, thank you for joining us. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, really excited to be with the two of you, the Ark brothers. Uh, <clears throat> really want to, to be talking about this uh, this particular study. I mean, who knew <clears throat> HER2 and colorectal cancer, right? HER2 breast cancer, HER2 ultimately gastric cancer, although we hit a wall with gastric and now we're seeing that wall or that ceiling being shattered. But <clears throat> in colon cancer, you know, the history dates back to the early 2000s. Uh, there was a study that looked at irinotecan and trastuzumab, and they stopped it in its tracks because the 7% rate of discovery for a HER2, for a, for a target, was considered low yield. Imagine that. Today, we talk about <laughs> the 1% to 2%. And so it was dropped, and, and, and the thought was that, well, let's not develop HER2 target therapies in call cash, although there were some signals there. And we learned that trastuzumab on its own is not uh, 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 an active agent. You know, the Italians did some of the early studies with PDX modeling with HER2 uh, agents, and they found that you have to combine two agents, specifically napatinib and, and trastuzumab, to, to get the desired effects. And that led to Heracles, which showed, you know, a modest uh, response rate, interesting PFS, then trastuzumab, pertuzumab. Then we started hearing about others uh, such as trastuzumab, deroxtica, and TDM1 didn't fly through. So it became a hotbed of drug development. With tucatinib, the, the interesting part with tucatinib is that it's a highly potent, highly selective HER2 tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it also crosses the blood-brain barriers. It happens that patients with HER2 colorectal cancer are at higher propensity to develop brain metastases, so this made sense. Um, it's very clean, unlike lapatinib, which has off-target uh, off side effects. This one tends to be very, very clean. I mean, it still has the diarrhea and, and the fatigue that you see with most TKIs, but you skip a lot of the other stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and preclinical work showed that tucatinib and trastuzumab is very potent when combined. So the design ended up being expanding to cohort B, which looks very much like cohort A, and then randomization to cohort C, which is asking a question that was never asked, is what is the potential effectiveness or efficacy of single agent uh, tucatinib? Now, we know trastuzumab on its own has less than 10% response rate, consistently. So it was important to separate those, allowing crossover to, to see if we can salvage many of these patients. The primary endpoint of the study was overall response rate, you know, uh, given the design of the study. And uh, essentially, the study hit its primary endpoint, 38%, and the median duration of response was a little bit more than a year. Uh, and then the overall survival, as reported, was uh, more than 24 months. Uh, and uh, the median PFS, and we're talking about refractory patient population, and then the median PFS was a little bit more than eight months. And you can see the waterfall plot looks pretty nice. I mean, you know, most of these patients are having some shrinkage. We had some CRs. I can tell you we have patients that are still on treatment now four to five years later, just with tucatinib and trastuzumab, no chemo. It's pretty fantastic uh, uh, outcomes, and, and the tolerability has been uh, 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 pretty acceptable you know, for this. And so we got that approval, uh, January 16th, 2023, you know, the first approval in colon cancer, HER2 positive colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And now this is moving to, uh, uh, you know, a global, uh, confirmatory first line study with tucatinib, trastuzumab and four Fox versus four Fox best biologic mountaineer three. So very exciting time. You know, I think. For uh, for our patients with colon cancer overall, but now specifically, that small subgroup of I'd say about three to four percent of patients with HER2 positive colorectal cancer. Well, thank you so much for going over that. And to reiterate, it is a small population, three to four uh, percent that we're looking at. 
But to clarify the way we were defining her to positive in this is IHC or fish positive. That's different than what the approval has been for things like lung cancer, where we're looking for her to mutation or ERBB2 mutation. No, this was not meant for her to mutations. Her two mutations are rare in in colon cancer. The one time you see her two mutations becoming relevant is as a mechanism of resistance uh, to to her two uh, driven tumor shows. One thing I I want to emphasize because this is for our community colleagues, but also for our academic colleagues. It is important to test early before you decide on treatment from first line colon cancer. We always think about RAS. We always think now about BRAF a little bit more. We think about MSI high, but we always think about HER2. Well, you know, this is for refractory patients, but we, we've presented some data at ESMO, and there's quite a bit of data here and there that, that was presented uh, as well. Uh, preclinically also supporting uh, this concept that HER2 amplifications are predictive of uh, EGFR inhibitors resistance. So resistance to EGFR inhibitors. Now, why is this important? Because it, it happens that the HER2 amplified tumors in colon cancer are mostly left-sided and 70% of them with the RAS wild type. So if you have a RAS wild type left-sided tumor, there's a 10% chance there will be a HER2 amplification in there. And that predicts negatively for the effectiveness of EGFR inhibitors, whereby if you didn't have that HER2 uh, tested, you would treat typically that patient with an EGFR inhibitor. So that's why it's so important, you know, as you plan, you plan really early, other than the fact that there's a first-line study that's ongoing and we want to support that study. But it also helps in you know, clinical applicability by eliminating EGFR inhibitors. Then you start planning for your next line of therapy, which now would be to catalyst prostuzumab, uh, as it's the only FDA-approved uh, regimen. Absolutely. Thanks so much for mentioning that, Dr. Saab. Uh, two questions corresponding to that. Now, once we have tested these patients upfront for NGS, now would you test them again on mm. progression? Mm. And is there any utility to that? And the second question being, as you mentioned, the anti-EGFR utilization in left-sided, would you rather consider to catnip trastuzumab combination in earlier line as opposed to two lines after what the FDA approval stands? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, that, the, these are important questions. Well, so uh, uh, what we do, and I, I, I will tell you this, there's, there's, I don't necessarily recommend this to be done widely, but in my practice, Every patient that comes through the door gets tissue and liquid tested from day one. The reason why I get liquid because I want my answers quickly. There's a high concordance rate between what... So if you find it in liquid, it's in tissue. Now, if you don't find it in liquid, it can still be in tissue. So you still want to wait for the tissue. But there's 90 plus percent chance that you're going to find concordance between the two. Pretty high bar. Uh, now, the caveat is, of course, if you don't have access to clinical trials or these agents, do you want to, you know, burden your practice and your patient with additional tests? Then it becomes questionable. You know, a practice like mine, it makes sense. Absolutely. Repeating NGS is not necessary. Now, you, you're bringing a great point, though, because we, we haven't touched upon this. You know, w what if a patient actually progresses onto catalytic and tristuzumab? So what next? Can we apply the breast cancer principle of, you know, continuing with HER2 target therapy? Well, short answer is the only probably agent that makes sense would be trastuzumab deroxtecan. Absolutely. And, and that, that, that may, that may actually, this is where it may be more important to repeat a biopsy and confirm that HER2 is still expressed. The one thing we we're trying to do is again, uh, that's a separate call questions is can we uh, follow patients through with uh, uh, liquid biopsies and correlate liquid to tissue meaning do I have to put a needle in in, the, in that tissue do I have to subject the patient to another biopsy or can I just with the liquid confirm that if there is still a HER2 clone amplified I can go to trastuzumab deroxtecan that has some data supporting it, but we're not there yet. 
However, I do use it quite a bit in clinic when uh, when I want to do the switch. Uh, and so far, I've seen I've seen a lot of interesting. I can tell you in my own practice again, I've seen some interesting correlations. It it is it is amazing in colon cancer. It's 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 a bit heterogeneous, and you can have multiple clones coexisting. Some are HER2 expressing, others may not be. And when you apply the HER2 target therapies, mm -hmm. you eliminate really nicely those that are HER2 driven, but then those that are not. Stay, stick around, those are unlikely to respond to trastuzumab deroxycan. What I've done, I've gone back to chemo, killed off those clones, uh, then went back to, say, trastuzumab deroxycan. Going back to the same thing, outside clinical trial, patient has progressed. Would you have someone in the community say, I don't have the repeat NGS, just stick with chemotherapy, or would you say that give TDXD a try? You know, I would... Uh... I, I would say give TDXT a trial. There's a good chance that uh, the HER2 clones are still there. Uh, just remember, TDXT is an interesting agent. It does not really care about whether HER2 is active or not. All what it cares is HER2 is present. That's because it docks on it and releases the chemo. And so theoretically, you can be resistant for most patients to anti-HER2 therapy, and yet when you go to trastuzumab deroxycan, uh, although the, the 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 receptor itself is not relevant as much anymore, but it's it it serves as a docking station. You may, you know, you may be unnecessarily treating you know uh, a small percent of patients, which ideally we want to find those out ultimately because there are some toxicities with this agent. But I think it's it's probably be we're better off going to trastuzumab deroxycan with a 40 plus percent response rate. Then go back to chemotherapy, which has, you know, less than 20% response rate. Thanks for going over that, Dr. Sam. And as you mentioned, the data for anti-GFR agents is also weak when it comes to a HER2-positive patient population. Now, if it's a left-sided RAS wild-type tumor we are dealing with, would you consider utilizing tucatinib trastuzumab in an earlier line as opposed to yeah. waiting for two lines? Yeah, I thought they didn't answer that question yet for you, but I will not. So the answer is... I think it will have utility in the future. I, I believe it's going to be actually, you know, I'm a big believer of hitting biology early because you hit biology early, your effect is going to be amplified further. You know, these tumors are less dirty, they're cleaner, the drivers are more defined, there are less resistant clones, so you may actually do the patient better. Unfortunately, the approvals right now are, and most of, and all the studies were done in later lines. So in this setting, this is why we have Mountaineer 3 that's looking at the first line to catalyst trastuzumab plus four fox. And I think I encourage, you know, all our colleagues to think about this study when you test for HER2 and consider referring patients to 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 the clinical trial. because um, that would be the best way for us to answer the question. Uh, I wouldn't do it outside of a clinical trial, although I tell you what, it's it's so compelling seeing the responses, seeing some of these patients going for four or five plus years uh, and doing great you know, makes a really strong case to consider it. But unfortunately, again, we need that answer uh, in clinical trials. Not unfortunately, I mean, it's the way it is. But I wish we, I, I wish I had a better way <laughs> to get, to get <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Dr. Saab, initially you mentioned that, that HER2 patients have higher intracranial activity. Uh, that is what we know from breast cancer as well, right? Between hormone receptor and HER2 and triple negative HER2 actually has the highest incidence. Do we have some numbers historically what these numbers are for colon cancer? So we, we we don't have good numbers, but I can tell you that if you look at all colon cancer patients, they're about 3%. Uh, likely this is triple, at least triple, three to four times higher with the HER2 amplified tumor. So I'd say about 10, 10 to 15%, depending again where they at in their stage. And uh there is, there is Heracles A, actually, Heracles A with lapatinib trastuzumab did publish some of that data, and it's within that range. It's a wow. small, obscure abstract somewhere. Uh, we're collecting that data on tucatinib trastuzumab. Uh, again, we've seen very few patients, incredibly few patients who actually had that. So historically, I think we're, we, we may be doing better here, but we need to confirm that data before, you know, I, I, I say too much. Uh, yeah, and, and and but 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 there is a good good reasoning uh, for tucatinib 
uh, use in 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 cancers that you know uh, have a higher propensity to go to the brain, and I think that's one of them here. Now, continuing on with the theme of breast cancer in comparison to colon cancer, uh, Dr. Bekaisab, we have been using capecitabine to catnib and trastuzumab for our R2 patient population in breast cancers. And uh, now, the common side effects that we do encounter there is diarrhea. Mm -hmm. What are the common side effects in this study that was that were noticed, and how do you address that in your clinic? Yeah, since we're not using capecitabine, so the diarrhea, the risk of diarrhea is actually lesser. Most of the toxicities are grade one, a little bit, a little bit of grade two, and very few grade three. The most common remains diarrhea, uh, but it's quite manageable. Uh, for grade one and grade two, most of these patients actually will need minimal intervention, uh, usually lop loperamide and, and, and just, you know, avoidance of, of food that may be aggravating. Uh, uh, for grade three, of course, you know, you need to interrupt. Uh, and that's in, a, in, in I, I think, 5% or less of the patients. Uh, you will need to interrupt, probably dose reduce. And most of these patients, say, none of them actually dropped off the study. So all of them continued uh, on, 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 on the treatment. Um, you know, with the appropriate uh, dose uh, dose modification. So I think I think depending on the grade, the toxicity grade uh, of uh, uh, you know of the diarrhea, then you can maneuver accordingly. Fatigue is the other thing, but you know, all these TKIs cause fatigue, and it tends to be uh, 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 dose dependent, but also time dependent. A lot of the fatigue can come up later rather than earlier. Uh, Again, you know, patients have to stay active, you know, and 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 uh, uh, we've not had issues with fatigue to the point where we had to reduce the dose or drop the drug completely. Uh, and like I said, you know, we have some patients going years on this, having good quality of life, pretty much going back to normal life for for many. Right. Overall, manageable side effects in return of very responsive drug regimen here. Well, to summarize, uh, tocatinib trastuzumab is now approved for HER2 positive metastatic colon cancer patient population after two lines of treatment. Dr. Bekesov, thank you so much for your work, uh, which has led to one more treatment option for our metastatic colon cancer patient population. We will eagerly await OS data. Thank you again for being with us today. Well, thank you and uh, glad to be here. And again, you know, uh, always excited to be uh uh, you know, part of another therapy yet for our patients with GI cancers.